Well, in our day, Protestant churches are engaged in what they often call the worship wars. The worship wars. And everybody seems to have an opinion about what they want out of worship. Some even say, some go so far as to say that in order to appeal to the lost, to appeal to our culture, we must create services that cater to them, that accommodate them, and are made for them. It's even getting so bad that even in some Presbyterian churches, congregations split their people up into separate services. One service is said to be a traditional service, and another a contemporary service. But in hindsight, if you were just to step back and consider the worship wars, the shocking question that is missing is not what does this group of people want and what does that group of people want and what does the lost want? The question that is missing is what does the Lord want? What does God desire in worship? And the very fact that we do not ask what pleases God betrays a great sense of unbelief in the church. It truly does. Because if one truly loved their God, would not the natural question be, what does he want? What does he desire? What does he want of my life? What does he want of my worship? Those are the natural questions that the man or woman of faith should be asking, isn't it? And the irony is that the question of what does God want is probably least asked by those who say they have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is quite shocking, of course, because if you did have a personal relationship with the Lord, wouldn't you ask the question, what does he want? Friends, the testimony of the word from beginning to end is that God is a jealous God. He is jealous for his bride's faithfulness, jealous for his bride's adoration, jealous that she would adore him in the way that he has told her to adore him. But the testimony of the scripture is once again that the bride so often does not seem to have a heart for her God. She often says that she worships Jesus But she has forgotten the very basic facts of love. For Jesus has said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Friends, what you and I must recognize then is that it is very, very easy for us to fall into unfaithfulness. It is easy for us to fall into unbelief when it comes to the most important topic of worship. And so we must always be careful to inquire of the Lord and search his word to us to find out what he wants, lest we find ourselves like Israel today in the text, called a spiritual harlot, called a spiritual whore. Because get this, we're going to see the contrast here, because she was worshiping him for her own gratification You see, that's one of the problems when our worship doesn't terminate on God's desires. If you want to take the marital analogy to its limit, it is self-gratification when you worship the Lord the way that you want uh, want him to be worshipped. And so we come to our theme this afternoon that we are to be faithful, express our faithfulness to God through our worship. And we look at the theme through two burdens Hosea carried. Uh, So the sermon actually carries a little bit more weight than it normally would because we have to consider Hosea's burden before we consider the burden of the message that he carried. So the two burdens we have, they're on your outline. The first is the burden of his marriage, that Hosea is a living parable himself, his life is. And the burden, second burden is the burden of his message, Israel's harlotry in worship. That's a heavy message to proclaim to a people that they are spiritual whores. And that's the burden of his message. Well, last time, let's start. Well, first, let's start with the burden of Hosea's message, uh, marriage, rather, not message. 
the burden of Hosea's marriage. Last time we saw the message of Hosea and that it revolved around spiritual adultery. That um, unfaithfulness to God is not just a legal violation, which would be bad enough. But for those in the covenant, breaking God's commandments is a personal affront. It is an attack on his person as somebody who has a relationship with his people as a marriage covenant. It is as grievous as adultery. It is as grievous as harlotry. And the message of Hosea is a message for the church even today. We recall that we heard from Peter that the message of the prophets was meant to reach into our own time and place to point us to the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow And so how much more does this message apply to us who have witnessed the glories of Christ in its ultimate form? God demonstrates his own love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, the message of Hosea is amplified for our age because, beloved, to be unfaithful to a God who loved his people so dearly And so greatly as to die for their sins must make you recoil in horror. Married couples, I hope that the thought of adultery entering into your marriage would cause you to recoil in horror as well. See, that's the kind of response the Lord wants from you in the book of Hosea. That as you see this this marriage here in the text, and you recoil from the harlotry of Gomer, that you would apply that to yourself and say, that's what it's like when I'm unfaithful to the Lord. And if you can't see that, friend, there is something terribly wrong with your heart. If you cannot understand the way that we provoke the Lord with our sin, especially our high-handed sins. Friends, remember, your God is real. Your God is alive. Your God is personal. Your God loves. Your God loves you, church, as his bride. He wants your heart. He wants you pure and chaste. He wants you to be a faithful bride who will be enraptured by her husband. Well, today, as we continue to walk through this text, let's consider the burden that the Lord had laid on Hosea in his calling. And the Lord chooses to use that word burden to describe the message he gives his prophets. In other places, you remember the burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see, the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi, the burden of the valley of vision, Isaiah 22, and on and on. Why does the Lord carry, call his oracles burdens because they have a tremendous weight to them that word burden is a common word in the bible it's used to describe a great weight very much like our word burden whether it's physical whether it's spiritual whether it's emotional as moses complained about the difficulty of bearing the children of israel he complained to the lord Moses did. Why have I not found favor in your sight that you have laid the burden of all these people on me? It's a great weight that the prophet carries in his ministry. And it is in that sense that God's oracles are burdens. The prophets had difficult messages to deliver. Messages that called out the sins of the people. Messages of promised judgment to the unrepentant and the covenant breaker. What a difficult message it is for a man to proclaim. You think of what Hosea's message was. Your whores, your spiritual harlots, you've all played the harlot by turning away from the Lord. What man wants to get up and say such things? But that's the burden that the Lord laid upon him. And when the Lord lays a burden on a man to proclaim, he has no choice in the matter. He must carry the burden. He must proclaim it even as he becomes an object of scorn and ridicule as Hosea was. 
Well, even today for preachers, a preacher is told not to preach a text until he has asked the Lord to give him a burden from it that he carries with him into the pulpit. It's the same kind of ministry, though the revelation takes a slightly different form. Well, the burden that the Lord laid upon Hosea was not just in his message. It was also in his marriage. In verse 2, the Lord, listen to the language, commands him to take a wife of harlotry, to show that the land has committed great harlotry by departing from the Lord. And so this is an intensely personal message for the man. He must marry a woman who will become unfaithful to him. And friends, if you've ever experienced it or know somebody who has gone through it, a marriage that becomes a cross to bear is a terrible burden to bear indeed. Well, I do want to mention that in the history of interpretation, there has been a difference of opinion whether Hosea married Gomer or whether this is a vision. And the difficulty comes because ministers of God were forbidden to marry a harlot. Leviticus 21 verse 7. And so the question is, why would God break his own law to command something forbidden? So older commentators, and I believe Calvin falls in this category, try to resolve the difficulty by saying this is a vision. This is a vision that Hosea gets. Um, On the other hand, Matthew Poole and Matthew Henry, while acknowledging that others see it as a parable, lean towards a more literal reading of it as a true marriage. And there are clues that this is the case, especially because there are children who are treated as historic children. It's on that basis that Matthew Poole said, the words bear him a son, verse 3, seems to favor the literal acceptation of all this as really done, and not only as represented in vision, parable, or hieroglyphic. In addition, the text also lacks the common exegetical markers that show it to be a vision like in prophecies like the Revelation or even Isaiah's sixth chapter, where he sees a vision of the Lord in the temple. And you can also resolve, commentators resolve the tension of Leviticus 21. If you see Gomer not as a woman on the street that Hosea married, but as a woman who becomes a harlot in the marriage, there's a clue that that is the case. The first child, Jezreel, is said to be Hosea's. She bore him a son. But sadly, you don't see that same language for the other two children. They are likely the children of harlotry. And all it says is that she bore the children. And it doesn't say that uh, she bore them for Hosea. Well, we'll get to that a little bit when we consider the other two children. But for now, leaving aside the, the history of interpretation there, just pause and consider for a moment the great burden that the Lord had laid on the man. Think of the cross that this man was going to bear in his life to follow Jehovah. It's a great and tremendous burden. If you're married, and I hope for all of you, your wedding day was a day of great joy. I can say with absolute certainty, my wedding day was one of the great days of my life, as as it should be, because we rejoice that the Lord has made two into one. But the wedding day for Hosea would be a day where his hopes for his house would be dashed when the Lord told him to marry a woman who would be unfaithful. The Lord told him to marry a woman who would sell herself, that he would become a man humiliated over and over again by his own wife. What man wants to live with a woman who is a notorious whore known on the streets? How much ridicule did Hosea endure? How much reproach came on his ministry as others saw a holy prophet whose own wife was unfaithful to him? But that was the point of the message, wasn't it, people of God? They should have seen the prophet as a thing of scorn. And as they considered that the Lord was using Hosea as a living parable, they should have then covered their mouth And saw the scorn that they brought on their own God. When they think of the scorn that came on Hosea. Friends, how easily we can miss the message of the book. Even when God smacks us upside the head 
with it. A serious burden was laid on the prophet, but it was meant to reflect the relationship the Lord had with his own people. Yet what is so interesting about Hosea, with such a difficult providence laid upon him, with such a difficult future given to him by the Lord, what you don't see in the book is the prophet speaking back to God. Do you? Was he like Jonah, who ran away from God's commandment? Was he like Habakkuk, who was astonished at God's word and waited to see the resolution to it? Instead, in verse 3, Hosea, we hear of Hosea that, So he went and took Gomer. How obedient is this man? How faithful is this prophet to the burden that the Lord laid on him? It's so amazing when you look at the book and you look at Hosea's response. The closest I could think of for such a heavy burden is really Mary's own response, wasn't it? Didn't she say something like this? Behold the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. That is the response that Hosea has. And Hosea shows you what faithfulness looks like, people of God. You know, when your love for God... And your reverence for God are such that when the Lord gives you a difficult path to obey, a difficult path to walk, a difficult providence that maybe you alone will have in this world, you can say, let it be to me according to your word. And you will sweetly comply with the Lord of providence. And as we consider our theme of the book, our great love we are to have for our Christ, we must remember at all times that our love for God must trump even the love we have for those in our home. Matthew 10 verse 36, a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Friends, I know, I know as your elders, several of you live that text. Enemies in your own house. But Jesus averts your gaze from your household and says, follow me, love me all the more. Carry your cross, carry your burden, and follow me, for I am your first and your great love. I will make your burden and yoke light. Yes, you will understand in glory why you carried that cross, but for now, follow me in love until the day comes when I wipe away your tear. Hosea's marriage demonstrates how great a cross you might have to follow the Lord Jesus. But Hosea loved Jehovah so much, evidently, that he gave up his own hopes for marital bliss and a faithful wife because more than a blissful marriage, the man desired Jehovah. Friend, if in God's providence you find yourself in a difficult marriage, if you find yourself even in a marriage with an enemy in your own house for Christ's sake, Continue to love Jesus. Continue to follow him. And while that marriage may be a grief you carry until glory, friend, your love for the Lord will put it all in its proper place in due time. But even more than that, even as we appreciate Hosea's burden, Hosea causes us to appreciate even more the burden that the Lord Jesus Christ carried for our sake. You see, God did not call Hosea to do something he would not do in a much greater way. If the Lord has called you to carry a great cross today and you struggle with it, what you need to remember is that he carried a much greater cross for your sake. And he was crucified on that cross. You see, the problem is so much when we consider Hosea's sufferings, we forget Christ's. And we only look at the man, Hosea. Remember 1 Peter 1.11 last week, in which Peter spoke of the prophets. The spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. 
So how does Peter tell you to interpret Hosea? To see the sufferings of Christ, to see the great love that Jesus has for his bride and the awful price that he paid to redeem a harlot at Calvary. Once more, like we said last week, to think of Hosea as this sort of sappy love story between Hosea and Gomer is to miss the point entirely. This book is about the faithfulness of the Lord Jesus Christ, with Hosea portraying him as a great type. This book is about our hearts being prone to being unfaithful to God, with us being portrayed by Gomer, not Hosea. This book connects the grief of adultery into something tangible for us so we would understand innately our unfaithfulness to a God who loves us so much and desires that we would love Him in turn. That we would love Him. Why? Because He first loved us. Hosea's marriage, then, friends, is an illustration of how we grieve the Lord. And the problem is with our hearts that it seems like we don't get it until you see a book like Hosea that illustrates it with human beings. We don't get how we grieve the Lord. And that is the burden Hosea portrays in his marriage. And his marriage itself becomes part of the message. And yet showing just how perverse our hearts are, somehow we have turned this book into merely a show of sympathy for the man, Hosea. Once again, being blind to the grief that we bring on God that caused him to redeem us in Jesus Christ. And so we miss that we might be behaving like Gomer, both as individuals, but also as a church. Well, if that was Hosea's burden in marriage, and we'll consider more of those burdens In the upcoming weeks. If if that was Hosea's burden in marriage. Let's consider the burden of Hosea's message. Israel is unfaithful in her worship. To understand that. You must know some history. Consider verses 3 and 4. Which say. So he went. Speaking of Hosea. He went and took Gomer. The daughter of Diblaim. And she conceived and bore him a son. Then the Lord said to him. Call his name. Jezreel, for in a little while I will avenge the bloodshed of Jezreel on the house of Jehu and bring an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. It shall come to pass in that day that I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. So God tells Hosea to name the child, the firstborn, Jezreel. And the reason for it is not necessarily in the name. The name means God scatters or God sows. Uh, God gives you the reason for the name beyond the meaning of it, literally. For he says, in a little while, I will avenge the bloodshed of Jezreel on the house of Jehu. Now, if you don't know that the history there, this text will not strike you the way it did to Hosea's original audience. For if you know Jehu's sins... Israel's sins that God is upset with here becomes evident. So I want to spend a little bit of time reviewing that history as succinctly as we can. I know it's a lot in a short amount of time, but I I pray that you'll be able to get it and then review it yourself a bit later. Now, Jehu lived in the time of Ahab and Jezebel, and you probably know them. Those two were the most wicked couple to sit on the throne of Israel. And they were grotesque in their violations of the first commandment. Now, this is not a surprise because Jezebel was a pagan. She was the daughter of a a Sidonian, a Phoenician. And uh, Ahab went far beyond the original Jeroboam's sins because he served Jezebel's god, Baal. And Ahab threw out Jehovah worship out of the land and actually persecuted the true prophets. He broke that first great commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And so you might remember the Lord sent Elijah to confront him, this famous confrontation. Then it happened when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said to him, Is that you, O troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed 
the Baals. Ahab was the troubler of Israel. He forsook the Lord and showed his love towards the false god, Baal. Now, what happens next is pretty legendary, children, boys and girls. You might not remember Jehu, but you surely remember Elijah, don't you? And boys and girls, don't you remember when Elijah confronted almost a thousand false prophets of Baal and Asherah? And God brought fire down from the heavens to prove that he is uh, alone as God and demonstrated that Baal is nothing more than an idol, a vain imaginary construct. Well, you probably remember that, that great showdown. Well, Ahab and Jezebel were so corrupt and so wicked, they killed and they persecuted the people of God that the Lord chose to put an end to their house by Jehu, who was an officer in their army. And in 2 Kings 9, the Lord does this extraordinary thing. He has Elisha anoint Jehu as the next king of Israel. So now there are two kings in Israel, Ahab and Jehu. And Jehu ruthlessly eradicated all who were of Ahab's house. You, remember, you might remember, boys and girls, that he threw Jezebel out of her window and she fell on the ground and lay in a pool of her own blood and the dogs came and ate her. That was to fulfill the word of the Lord that the, he gave to Elisha that on the plot of ground at Jezreel, Dogs shall eat the flesh of Jezebel, and the corpse of Jezebel shall be as refuse on the surface of the field in the plot at Jezreel, so that they shall not say, here lies Jezebel. Jezreel, the name of Hosea's son, is the place where Jezebel's blood was spilled. But there would be even more bloodshed at Jezreel. Ahab had 70 sons. And Jehu slaughtered them all there. So Jehu killed all who remained of the house of Ahab in Jezreel, 2 Kings 10. Jehu was certainly a bloody man, spilling so much blood at Jezreel. But then he goes and he eliminates all the Baal worshippers in Israel. He drew them out. He had this phony worship service that he instituted. And he tore down Baal's temple and eliminated all who came to worship Baal. And the scripture says, thus Jehu destroyed Baal from Israel. And so Jehovah says to Jehu, because you have done well in doing what is right in my sight and have done to the house of Ahab all that was in my heart, your sons shall sit on the throne of Israel to the fourth generation. Now, as a reward for Jehu eliminating Ahab and his house and for him restoring the first commandment, God rewards Jehu by having his sons be king for four generations. Now, as we come back to Hosea, we are in the time of the third son, Jeroboam II, third in line from Jehu. So now you can see how all these texts are so closely connected And the fourth generation will end with Jeroboam, the second son, Zechariah, who would be assassinated, ending the line of kings from Jehu and bringing God's word to pass. Now, I know that was a lot of history in a very short amount of time. So go spend time with Hosea and 2 Kings 9 and 10 and look at that background for yourself. But if you take nothing else away, remember that Jezreel is the place where Jehu massacred Ahab's house. And his reward for removing the troubler of Israel from the land was to have his descendants on the throne for four generations. And Jeroboam II, the Jeroboam of Hosea's time, is third in the line. And so the time of kings from Jehu is coming to a close. For God says in Hosea, he will avenge the bloodshed of Jezreel, on the house of Jehu. And that might puzzle you for a moment after hearing God's commendation. If Jehu did what God wanted, why would God avenge the blood of Jehu uh, of Jezreel on Jehu? Did God not want Ahab's house destroyed? Did he not want the bales removed? Well, the answer, as we come now to the motive for Jehu, is that Jehu did not do it for God's sake. 
Jehu did not do it because he loved God. He was not motivated by a love for God. Boys and girls, this is why good deeds, quote unquote, that men do outside of Christ do not count for anything in God's eyes. Jehu probably did God's work because he wanted the throne of Israel. And this was the way to have it. So he would play the part of mercenary. He would play the part of assassin for hire. But did the man have a great love for God? No. And you see this in other places. God very often uses the sinful desires of men to accomplish holy purposes. Especially when a holy man would not accomplish his purposes the way that Jehu would. You see it in other places. God raised up the Assyrians to chastise his people. But then what? He judges the Assyrians for doing it because they didn't do it for God. They did it out of a bloodthirsty nature. God had a holy end, but the Assyrians were bloodthirsty, sinful men and didn't do it for God. How about when the Lord used Judas to crucify Christ? God desired the crucifixion of Christ for our salvation. But then what? He punishes Judas for it because Judas's motives were sinful And the Lord had to use a sinner like Judas, didn't he? Because a godly man would never crucify the Lord of glory. Praise God for his wisdom that he can use the darkest sinner to accomplish the holiest end. But because they did it for sin, they are judged by him. And so it was with Jehu. He did not care about the commandments of God and he did not love God. In 2 Kings 10 verse 31 we read, Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord God of Israel with all his heart. For he did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam who had made Israel sin. Jehu's heart was not right with the Lord. The Lord makes a point of saying he did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam the first. And that is an obvious point, isn't it? We considered it last week. When you consider that Jeroboam's name was cherished by the house of Jehu, why else would you name this current king Jeroboam II? Jeroboam's sins were not despised by Jehu as God despised them. For 2 Kings 10 verse 29 says, Jehu did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam the son of Nebat, who had made Israel sin. That is, from the golden calves that were at Bethel and Dan. All right. Jehu did not repent of Jeroboam's sins. You remember that last time. Jeroboam corrupted the worship of God. And that is a breach of the second commandment. Especially, how often do the people of God do this? Especially that golden calves were instituted for the worship of Jehovah. And that is an important point we must remember. Just as with Aaron at Sinai, these calves were not representing another God, a different God. These calves were representing Jehovah. And that's what makes it not a first commandment violation, but a second commandment violation. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. This is a corruption of the true worship of God. And God expressly forbids it. And any man who loved God would know that when he read the law of God. But especially a king. What does Deuteronomy 17, 18 say? Kings were to write out the law with their own hand to have a copy for themselves. A king should never plead ignorance of the law of God. And so here it is. While Jehu obeyed the first commandment, at least outwardly, and removed Baal worship, he did not follow the second commandment, which governs the worship of God. And so God is displeased with Jehu. Consider how Jehu responds and compare it to a man like Josiah. When Josiah gets the law of God, he tears his clothes saying, Our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. Nor was Jehu like Hezekiah, who destroyed the bronze serpent and reformed the worship of God. Now those are kings who loved God and wanted God to be worshipped as he is. 
And isn't that the kind of man, isn't that the kind of woman that the Lord is seeking? What did Jesus say? God is seeking those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. And so Josiah and Hezekiah were men who did that, but not Jehu. And that now makes us understand the heart of worship, which is truly an expression of love for God. After the Lord prohibits the making of images in the second commandment, he explains why this commandment is so important. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. Hold on just a moment. Now you consider that Jehu's only going to get four generations. You can see there's a connection here with the second commandment. Of those who hate me. But listen, showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. To those who love me and keep my commandments. Friends, God is a jealous God, yes. He is jealous for his commandment. He is jealous for his honor. But he's also jealous for his bride to worship him the way that he wants to be worshipped. Because the second commandment tells you something so basic that so many people overlook. Because he says that this is how his bride shows her love for him. Those who love me and keep my commandments. The second commandment, the worship of God, is all about loving God, friends. Beloved, too many get so upset when they hear of the regulative principle of worship. Enshrined in Deuteronomy 12, verse 32, Whatever I command you, be careful to observe it. You shall not add to it nor take away from it. So many are upset by that. So many are upset that we say God regulates his worship and there are only certain things that we can do in it. But maybe, friends, if we would just come to understand that we show love for God, Through the keeping of his commandments, we would embrace that principle. Remember, beloved, worship is to give glory to God. It's not to gratify ourselves. Worship is to give glory to God. And it's not to gratify our flesh. It is not self-love. It is God-love. To worship the Lord without a love for Him and without a care for His desire is spiritual harlotry. And that is the kind of whoredom Israel was most guilty of. And that is the message that Hosea presents from naming his boy Jezreel. Friends, when you love God and you worship Him from the heart by following His commandments you will find that you will enjoy him because your heart is right with God. Not because your flesh is tickled. And so you will fulfill your chief end, boys and girls, to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And so for us in a church like ours, maybe the pointed message of Hosea tonight is Jesus not only wants you to worship him with the proper elements, as regulated by the word. He wants that absolutely. And we believe that. That is the most important thing. But he also wants your heart in it. And maybe that's more of the challenge for us. He wants you in it. Not only present and accounted for, but he wants you in it and engaged. He wants your soul to love him in worship And in this place, we pray that we are not only observing what the Lord wants in worship through our order of worship. For here you will sing only psalms. You will only pray and hear the word as it is read and preached. You will also observe the sacraments. Nothing else added. Nothing else removed. But we can do all that. And we can forget that the second commandment also governs our love for God in it. What good is there, friend, for you to be here right now worshiping with the proper elements, but without the heart in it? Is your heart in worship right now? Is your heart in worship? It's part of the commandment to love God and keep the commandment. Friends, remember, his mercy to a thousand generations is shown to they who love me 
and keep my commandments. Couldn't he have simply have said in the second commandment, his mercy is shown to those who keep my commandments? Why does he add, love me and keep my commandments? You have to consider it for yourself. He says to you, to you, child of God, love me and keep my commandments. In the second commandment, in other words, the Lord asked the question Jesus pressed Peter with. Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Beloved of God, do you love him? And if the answer is yes, would he not ask you next? If you love me, will you not worship me as I desire to be worshipped? Is that not what he did in a way with Peter? After Peter said, Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. What does Jesus do? He gives him a commandment. Feed my lambs. Do you see that? Do you love me? Then do what I tell you. And show me that you love me. Show me that your heart is right. Feed my sheep. Love me, Simon, and show it. The second commandment is exactly the same. Those who love me... And keep my commandments. Listen to Jesus elsewhere. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And so as we return back to Hosea and its theme, this message all throughout the Bible becomes obvious, doesn't it? Israel's corrupt worship was proof that she had abandoned her God. That her heart was not right with her first love. That she had abandoned her husband and she was playing the harlot. And that's the language I find so fascinating. the, The divines don't use Hosea as a proof text, as far as I know, for this question. But in larger catechism, question 110, when it speaks of the second commandment, and I highlighted this for you, it says false worship is spiritual whoredom. False worship is spiritual whoredom. In that, listen carefully, maybe to yourself, but certainly to others as well. Listen carefully to how worshipers speak about their worship services, and you will quickly find the language of self-gratification. Look for phrases like, I really enjoy worship when we sing such and such songs. I miss not having such and such in worship. I find it uplifting to worship the Lord this way or another. But isn't that really, at the end of the day, again, that language of pleasing the flesh? What I want. God's desires are not found there. So how can we say we love God and don't even think for a moment what pleases him? The desire of God needs to have a place in your heart. Friends, it is incredibly easy, even in this place, for worship to be all about you and not the Lord. If you truly desire God, friends, give him his desire in worship because you love him. And you know, the reason that the Reformed Presbyterian Church cares so much about God's worship is because he says to us plainly in his word that we would become harlots if we choose our own desire in worship. And we wish to be faithful to the Lord as one who submits out of the heart to his commandments. And that is the burden of Hosea's message in Jezreel. That Jehu's line is going to come to an end in the fourth generation because he was unfaithful to the second commandment. And now consider the burden of the message as he preaches this message to a king named Jeroboam II. He has to preach this message. And he presents his son as a reminder of God's prophecy. Jeroboam, look on my son Jezreel. I know that the Lord will avenge himself on your son, Zechariah. And Jehu's line is going to fall. What a hard message to present to a king. My son is named Jezreel because your son will be assassinated for unfaithfulness. Sadly, Jeroboam 
did not reform the nation when he heard the message. For we know that his priest dismissed another prophet, Amos, and told him, Go, you seer, flee to the land of Judah. There eat bread and there prophesy, but never again prophesy at Bethel. That is how Jeroboam II's administration saw the prophets of God. Go, go preach in uh, Judah. They listen to that kind of preaching. Go preach at the Reformed Presbyterian Church. Don't come here and preach that message. We don't listen to that kind of preaching here. That's essentially what was going on. Well, today the Lord has laid his case before you. He has presented his burden in the preached word. And how do you respond, child of God? Do you respond like Jeroboam? Or do you respond like Josiah, tearing your clothes in repentance if your heart has not been what it ought to be in worship? Friend, if you're convicted of your unfaithfulness in worship, whether because your heart is not in it, or whether because you just don't care about the second commandment, what is wonderful about the message of Hosea, and we'll get to it soon, is that if you repent of your sin, even in the second commandment, the Lord will forgive if you repent in Jesus Christ. Because as we remember the burden Hosea carried, we remember that his burden was absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing compared to the, Lord, the burden that our Lord Jesus carried, which was the burden of our own sin, even our sin of breaking the second commandment. And friend, he freely forgives, but he asks for faith, but he also asks for repentance, a turning away from the ways that you have broken that second commandment. That's what he wanted out of these faithless kings. It's also what he wants for you and me. So people of God, as we close, love your God and love him by worshiping him Do what he commands. Be diligent to find out what pleases the Lord. And if you truly love him, give it to him. Give it to him out of love. Please rise for prayer.